You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. Thank you guys always for being with us. As usual, our reminders to follow us on all social media sites. We are on Facebook as Hazard Ground Podcast. Also the same on Instagram, as well on Twitter at Hazard Ground. And if you guys would be so kind, please get on iTunes, leave us a rating and a review. We appreciate it so much that you guys are listeners. Just let us know what you think. And of course, if you ever have any suggestions for the Hazard Ground going forward, we'd love to hear those as well. This week's guest is someone that I have been like dying to get on the podcast uh, because of the battle that he was involved in. And it actually is the impetus for why the Hazard Ground exists. And it's the Battle of Takugar that took place during Operation Anaconda in Afghanistan in early 2002. He is a former Army captain. His name is Nate Self, and he joins us on the Hazard Ground. Nate, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Mark. My pleasure, man. All right, so let me kind of give you the background. So I came up with an idea for the podcast based off of uh, in my armory in the National Guard, we have up all these paintings. And they have them from every battle across American history, all the way back from the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror. And I would walk into my office every day, and, and on the wall, there was a picture of the Battle of Takugar, and it was, it's like a painting, you know, just a, you know, a rough yeah. sketch or whatever. And underneath it, it had a little write-up, and it had a write-up on the battle, and it, it talked about what went on and the back and forth and everything. And this was the time when the movie American Sniper came out, and I'm like, okay, everybody you know, knows the movie and knows the story, and I'm like... There are so many other stories out there that people don't know, and I keep reading this little blurb on Taco Gar, and I'm like, why does no one know about this? This should be a movie, and this is what I want people to know, and so my goal of this podcast is to make Taco Gar a movie eventually one day, but that's kind of how we got this. We got to this point just because you know, Taco Gar to me seems like it was such an incredible, unbelievable set of circumstances for what you guys went through, and not enough people know about it, so before we get into everything that happened up on that mountain in Afghanistan, tell us how you got you start in the military. Uh, well, uh, growing up, just like a lot of young boys in Texas, I was spent a lot of time outside, and I played like I was a soldier, but um, through high school, I didn't really think seriously about becoming a soldier until I started looking at college, and I saw West Point as an option that made a lot of sense, and uh, just felt that full uh, the draw to serve and so I went that route and uh, once I got to West Point and was exposed more to the soldiers in the army I just fell in love with uh, what the army was all about and particularly with, with uh, the infantry soldiers that I, I interacted with and uh, just wanted to serve in the infantry so um, after I graduated there I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the infantry and uh, went to Germany for my first duty station um, after the pipeline of army schools I had to go through, including ranger school, got married and went to Germany for our first, uh, first assignment. What year was this when you finally got commissioned and, and finished all this stuff up? Yeah. So I, I graduated West Point in 1998. It was commissioned and then spent about a year going to uh, Fort Benning and all the schools I had to go to there. Um, my wife was finishing up at Baylor university. She was a year behind me in high school, which we, where we had dated in high school and, uh, so once we were married, uh, we took off to Europe together, and um, I was hoping to be able to get over to Bosnia. That's why I wanted to go to Germany was so I could get into some sort of operation that was real. And uh, by the time I graduated from Ranger School, we knew that there were units going to Kosovo, which had just flared up um, in in, uh, in early '99. And so by about Thanksgiving in '99, I was in Kosovo peacekeeping mission. With my platoon living in a living out in sector and in a Serbian town, trying to keep people from killing each other and uh, running patrols on the border and trying to stop an insurgency, and it was just a really great place to learn, to lead, and uh, run operations in a real world environment. So it was a great uh, first experience for me in the army. It's interesting. I, it's always good to talk to the guys who signed up prior to 9/11 for the you know the guys who fought in the war on terror because. It was a different mindset back then, right? I mean, I was the same thing. I, I was commissioned in 99, so we had no idea what we were getting into. Like, it, we just knew that we were going into the military and didn't really know everything that it entailed. Obviously, you know, all of our worlds changed on 9-11. Where were you on that day, and what do you remember about it? Yeah, so on 9-11, I had already left Germany. I'd been hired to work uh, with the Ranger Battalion in Savannah, 
and I and I was a platoon leader. I had been a platoon leader in Savannah for almost a year at that point. Um, and uh, I was on 9/11 coming into work uh, late. No, I wasn't late. We were all coming in late because uh, we were going to be in the field for a few days. They gave us a late call, so I was driving through the gates at Hunter, Hunter Army Airfield and started hearing about the uh, the airliner that had hit one of the towers of World Trade Center. And by the time I got over to the unit and started uh, gathering with my squad leaders, we saw together, we saw the second aircraft fly in the World Trade Center. And, and we knew that we would be leaving sometime soon. Could have been within 18 hours. And uh, eventually, because of the way the rotations of the battalions were working out, we, we didn't deploy until December. But uh, we knew we were headed over. And you were in 3ID at the time? No, I was in 1st Ranger Battalion. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah. So I had come from a mechanized unit in Germany over to the Rangers. And I had been a platoon leader there for about a year when 9-11 happened. So. so when you get your first deployment, where are you going? What were you told? What were your expectations? Well, we were told that no one was supposed to know we were leaving. I think they were trying to give the impression that the footprint deployed, particularly the special operations footprint, had, had reduced and had been truncated or shrunk, if you will. And, and uh, so we were headed over to uh, initially to Bagram and our company was going to be split between Bagram and Kandahar. And our company was the only company from our battalion to go. And so it was kind of a piecemeal deployment that we were going to fall in on a task force that had um, uh, SEALs and Delta Force guys and folks from the Air Force and the 160th pilots. And it was going to be a small task force with a, with a specific mission of killing or capturing a list, a really short list of folks from uh, Al-Qaeda and, and the Taliban at the time. Let me ask you, go back to your experience in Kosovo. You know, you said that you wanted to go do a real mission, you know, and Kosovo was real when it was going on. I mean, it was a deployment. There were a lot of people who were going. Then you find out what you're going to go do in Afghanistan. You're part of the Ranger Regiment. I mean, you, this is one of the most elite organizations in all the military. Did real seem different for this than it was before? Um, you know, there was a threat on the ground in Kosovo. We had a couple of raids where there were armed insurgents um, working in the border regions. And so there was a heightened threat there. Plus there's the, the minefields and uh, there was there was threat on the ground. There were a lot of mines there in Kosovo. So I had already operated in a place where we knew that guys could get hurt um, and there was shooting. Um, but we were, we were not directly shot at and we didn't shoot anyone else. It was essentially ethnic groups trying to kill each other. And so we were kind of in the middle of that, but the risk was real. And we dealt with civilian casualties and murders and, and people that stepped on mines and sniper attacks and stuff like that. So I had at least some, what I felt to be at that point in my life, some real experience, but it wasn't um, being wounded or my soldiers being shot at. And so that was a different, that was a different gear altogether. The preparation for, uh, being killed or having to kill, um, and and 9/11 still fresh on our minds. Um, it's definitely a different mentality than going in to try to keep the peace. What was the training like before you left? Was it more amped up? Well, I felt like when I got to the Ranger Regiment, there was a different mentality around training and a different way of doing things in training, and so. For a year, I felt like it was amped up because our contingencies were worldwide contingencies that we were tracking and that we were we had to be prepared to deploy upon within 18 hours. And so the sense of possible combat was very real every day even prior to 9-11. So I felt like the training was uh, super realistic uh, throughout. Post 9-11, it was just kind of really just honing in on the kinds of things we knew in that environment we might have to do. Um, but it wasn't outside of our normal way of doing things. And I think that's just a testament to how the regiment and so many other units have geared themselves to do their jobs. And so you train as you fight. And, uh, and um, you know, I felt like we were ready. And, and, Nate, the only reason I ask that is because the conditions which you guys went into in Afghanistan in late 2001, early into 2002, 
I don't know that we were ever prepared for, and I, I mean that more just the terrain, the, the mountainous terrain that we were up against. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about grades that are like you know, 40, 50, 75 degrees. You're basically climbing straight up a wall, and what would take four to five minutes to walk on the ground um, you know, over the course of a quarter mile could take an hour in, in tra- traversing yeah. the mountains of Afghanistan. So it was totally different. So I was just kind of wondering, when you hit ground in Afghanistan, how prepared did you feel? Well, the operating environment is something that we could not prepare for. I mean, there's places we try to train, but the tra- to train realistically in an environment like what Afghanistan was is just really more da- more dangerous than we would like to train. And so I remember the first time I flew in Afghanistan, just a, um, it was near dusk and just flying in the mountains. I was just shocked at the brutality of the terrain. And knowing the altitudes that we had to operate at as well with our airframes, um, you wouldn't fly those profiles typically uh, in training because it's just too dangerous. Um, so it was another step. Um, the terrain and the operating environment alone, even without an enemy, for most of us was beyond anything we'd ever seen in a training environment. Um, so very dangerous. And then you added a, a lethal enemy that not only was uh, battle hardened through decades of war, but also knew the terrain very well. It made it much more difficult. Let's get into Takugar as part of Operation Anaconda. And what happened to you was well chronicled, not only in your book, Two Wars, but uh, it was a book on Roberts Ridge. Uh, Neil Roberts was the first SEAL who, that was the guy who, you, you know, I'll let you tell the story, but the guy you were going to get, the first Navy SEAL who was killed in battle. Um, and so this has been chronicled time and time again. Um, but leading up to the day of the events, talk me through what like a typical day was for you in Afghanistan at that point. Well, um, my platoon was in Bagram primarily, and there was another couple of platoons down in Kandahar. So our company was split as this task force overall was called task force 11. And, um, we were, we had a couple of roles. Uh, number one was, uh, to be able to support a raid or, or a vehicle interdiction or something like that, which would be directed towards a high-value individual, high-value target. If we had intelligence that suggested that there was someone important on the battlefield anywhere in Afghanistan, we would be called upon to go uh, kill or capture. And we were a part of that uh, operational package. Beyond that, we were also the quick reaction force. Our platoon was designated as a quick reaction force for pretty much uh, half of Afghanistan um, for our task force. And so if there was anything that was going on in our task force or special operations related and they needed reinforcement because they were under attack or the aircraft had gone down or any kind of kind of crisis contingency, we were on the hook for that. So we had kind of a list of priorities that we had to be prepared for combat search and rescue downed aircraft. Um, obviously, um, Going and getting someone that was killed, was killed or captured uh, was was uh, a part of kind of our ethos as well. And reinforcing special forces um, teams that might be out in sector. Um, and of course, any aircraft that had flown out of our compound, um, out of the 160th um, contingent of aircraft, we were directly on the hook to support them. And so leading into Anaconda, we didn't have much of a role. It was mostly a conventional fight all of Anaconda was. And so the first couple of days when it kicked off, um, we didn't really have much of a role. We were just kind of listening and and watching and waiting to see what was happening. The fight wasn't going well for the conventional forces. And so uh, Task Force 11 started to push some assets out into the battle space, uh, SEAL teams and others, to to try to get into places where they could see. Nate, and, let me ask you real quick. Effect, yeah. Sorry to cut you off. Why wasn't yeah. the battle going well for the conventional forces? Was it they were were they not prepared for the terrain? Were they overmatched? Were, what, what happened? Well, I should probably set the stage for what the what the operation was supposed yeah. to look like. There was uh, there was a there was a group of Al Qaeda fighters that we had chased in the Tora Bora region at the end of two thousand and one in December and very close to bin Laden, but started to move into Pakistan. And so that was a place we couldn't go. And although we were maybe a ridgeline away, we never uh, were able to get to him. 
that group of fighters kind of migrated down the border region of Pakistan to an area which had been a stronghold against the Soviets in the 80s. And this one particular zone or region um, near a town of, called Coast and Gardez, these, these towns in this area, kind of southeastern part of Afghanistan, they had essentially consolidated, regrouped, reorganized in that area. About a hundred, we thought, uh, I'm sorry, about a thousand fighters, we thought, were in that area. And they had essentially started to operate, maybe looking for a fight, not sure, because they knew what our assets were and that we could hit large masses of troops, which is why they didn't normally mass. But a group of troops that big, it was almost as if they were looking for a fight. And so they were in this area called the Shahi Kok Valley, which um, is a valley uh, ringed on three sides by mountains, north, south, and east. And um, the valley floor is about 8,000 feet, and the mountains rise to 10, 12, 13, 14,000 uh, feet going eastward towards Pakistan. And so they were in the valley floor kind of, kind of living in, and operating around some of the villages down there. And when, when our intelligence assets noticed this, uh, this kind of concentration of enemy troops, um, it was a target too big to pass up. And so conventional forces put a plan together to go in there and, and block all of the escape routes back to the east, south, and north into the mountains to keep them from getting into the mountains, to keep them in the open. They would land helicopters at kind of the escape routes where they would be able to enter into the mountains and block their escape and just kind of trap them in the valley. And then there would be this um, main effort that would sweep through the valley very methodically and it included a uh, friendly Afghan force. They were supposed to sweep through the valley and kind of clear the valley, kill and capture, uh, gather intelligence. The problem was when Anaconda kicked off, the enemy wasn't really in the valley anymore. They had already moved into the mountains, uh, ringing the valley, and they were ready for our operation coming in. So when the helicopters landed at the base of the mountains and tried to plug up the escape routes in the mountains, what they found was that they were being shot at from higher ground and they were pinned down and this went on for a few days um uh, just it it did not go as planned essentially because the enemy wasn't doing what we thought they were going to do and, and let me give some background here as well on the whole thing as you talked about in the torbora mountains in 2001 when they were on the hunt for bin laden they actually had uh, according to several sources uh, one that i've read in a book by dalton fury called kill bin laden they, they knew his location Uh, And you mentioned that the Afghan fighters who were fighting alongside of the U.S., part of that political strategy was that if they were to catch bin Laden, they wanted the Afghans to do it. People in Washington, D.C. wanted the Afghans to be able to say they caught him and we were in support of it because we didn't want it to be this all-out American force. And you talk about all those escape routes. A lot of people have asserted that's why bin Laden survived, because he was able to escape through those routes into Pakistan. And as you mentioned, this mountain range kind of was the one thing slowing his escape into Pakistan. Uh, and a lot of that was where part of the reason why we went into the mountains in Anaconda, not only for that force, but also they had a pretty good read on where bin Laden was and felt like he was there uh, and felt like they were close to capturing him. But uh, as you've clearly stated, you know, a lot of this, they were they were unprepared for how quickly these forces could rally and move and so on and so forth. So with all that, um, when do you guys get into the picture? Yeah, so since Anaconda wasn't going so well the first couple of days, there, um, there was a push to put um, some surveillance teams from our task force into the high ground so we could get a handle on the battle space. And if there was someone important uh, in this concentration of enemy troops, um, if there was someone on the battlefield, we could either figure that out through radio, radio intercepts or if there was a convoy that looked like it was high profile kind of leaving the battlefield, then we would have the eyes on it to be able to call in additional forces or airstrikes or whatever. So there was one particular SEAL team that was tasked with getting in on this mountaintop, which the mountain actually jutted out into the valley a little bit on the southern end of the valley. It's about 10,000 feet, which means it's about 2,000 feet uh, vertically above the valley floor. And you could see in almost every direction. So it was a great vantage point. It was a key piece of terrain, possibly a decisive piece of terrain for the battle. We wanted eyes on there and we wanted to be able to control air support in and out of the valley from there. So the SEAL team had a pretty big mission. A team of six or seven guys. Um, and 
they needed to get in that mountain and they wanted to get in there before the sun came up on the morning of March 4th. So Anaconda kicked off, I think, on the 28th of February. And so on the 3rd of March, overnight on the 3rd of March, the SEAL team was supposed to land offset the mount, offset from the mountain and move in under the cover of darkness, get to the mountaintop before the sun comes up, dig in, hide, and then be able to control air support in the valley and kind of report, observe and report. And just as things happen on the battlefield um, and, and with the equipment that we operate, uh, things break and it seems as if you never have enough of everything you need. And uh, so they had trouble kind of getting the aircraft they needed to get in there on time. So they were losing time throughout the night uh, from various, for various reasons and thought about moving to the next night, but losing a day wouldn't, wouldn't have helped anyone else in the ground any, any more than just trying to get in there. So they looked at uh, the mountaintop and, and looked at it on uh, surveillance that we had on the mountaintop and said, we think we can get in there tonight, but we have to land directly on it. So the SEAL team went in a one Chinook helicopter, land on top of the mountain. And as soon as they landed, they recognized they were landing into an enemy position. The mountain was already occupied. So they came under fire and uh, pilots uh, immediately began to evade and took off from the mountain. Uh, as they were being shot up, the helicopter was shot up pretty bad. Um, as they were flying off. And uh, you have a SEAL team that's trying to exit the aircraft um, as the aircraft's taking back off again. And the lead man off the aircraft was a man named Neil Roberts. Um, and he fell out of the helicopter. And as his helicopter's flying away, he's left alone uh, in, a, in an enemy position, which is now um, awakened, if you will, and shooting. Unreal. Just the, the picture that you've drawn really, I mean, I couldn't even imagine the scope of the operation, let alone feeling what Neil Roberts felt when he basically falls out of a helicopter, what, 10, 20 feet you know, to the ground, and the thing takes off and he's there and there's already people shooting at him. And immediately, for those listening who aren't military, you know, prior to number one, you got to go get him. You, 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 dead or alive, you have to go get him. If he can survive, we have to go help him. But if not, regardless, we have to go back and get Neil Roberts. So that's kind of where you guys come in, correct? Yeah, um, kind of. Um, so you're right. Um, our ethos, our creed, everything we say is uh, essentially that we don't leave people behind. Uh, dead or alive, we're coming back to get you. And that's what we believe, and that's what we live out. Um, and, and it's happened time and time again. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a virtuous way to live, that we're willing to sacrifice ourselves for other people later in our lives risk ourselves I mean, that's why we're soldiers anyway so um his team doesn't fully recognize um that they've left someone behind the pilot is frantically trying to get the aircraft on the ground safely which means he's coming off a 10,000 foot mountain he can't really control the aircraft it's dropping 2,000 feet down to the valley floor and he's trying not to crash it where everyone would kill so there were people on board the aircraft that were just trying to keep it in the air and getting it on the ground safely. But there were also people on the aircraft that already knew they were missing one. Um, by the time they hit the valley floor, they essentially crashed in the valley. Um, but no one else was seriously wounded or, or injured. And they started essentially to cross-level cross, cross level the information they knew they had left someone behind. So the team leader said, he's up there pointing at the mountain. So drop all the gear that you don't need, and we're going back up there. On foot? That's, yeah. So they they feel like they can get back to them. They're, they have this urgent need to get back up there. Obviously, a team member left behind. They're about 1,200 meters straight line distance from the mountaintop, and now they're 2,000 feet down. Oh, my so God. So this doesn't happen anytime soon. They start to recognize that. Meanwhile, I'm in Bagram. It's more than an hour time of flight away, and I hear that an aircraft has gone down. And I knew the aircraft had taken off, essentially originated from our compound. So back to my contingencies as the reaction force, we knew that we would have to go secure that aircraft. So I, I, I get my guys together, tell them they have a mission, they start gathering their gear. By the time I come back from the guys to the operations center, they start talking about there's someone missing. And uh, we need to be prepared as the quick reaction force to either 
secure the downed aircraft and its crew or find this missing person. And they can't decide which mission is ours or both. Um, and so the SEALs realize they can't make it back up to the mountaintop quick enough. Another aircraft comes in and lands next to them. Another Chinook picks them up, takes them back to the mountaintop. They land up there a second time. They come off the aircraft right into a gun battle looking for Neil Roberts. It's still dark. They can't necessarily find him. They charge into the enemy positions, which are in, a, in an area probably smaller than a basketball court uh, on top of a uh, peak. And there's bunkers um, and fighting positions and trenches already dug up there. And the enemy is dug in. So they move right into the enemy positions, begin fighting. Um, this gun battle is at very close range. They're exchanging grenades. I'm in Bagram loading aircraft with two Chinooks and about 20 Rangers. We take off and start flying to these guys, uh, not having a clear mission. Um, don't know exactly what's been going on there. We just know there's downed aircraft, there's possibly someone missing. We didn't know everything that happened to this this point uh, or exactly where they are. We had, we had, this, we had fixated on the downed aircraft location. We thought that's where we were going. And so we're flying along and uh, over the radio developing the situation. We hear a SEAL team that's in contact. We're asking for the PRF, which is us. Um, they're calling in close air support. Um, they take a heavy blow from a machine gun burst and a grenade, and they lose another man, and another one gets wounded pretty severe, severely in his leg. And the SEAL team leader makes the assessment that he can't hold this position any longer. So he orders his team off the mountaintop. Um, off the ridge, uh, down a bit to get out of the direct gunfire, maybe to consolidate and reattack. And um, they're shot at as they're getting off. And uh, one of the team doesn't make it off. Um, an Air Force uh, combat controller named John Chapman. So he's up there, uh, alive or dead, um, not real sure probably at least wounded fighting or unconscious or something. Um, he's left up there. So Neil Roberts was never located. John Chapman's up there now. The SEAL team is moving off the mountaintop and calling to QRF and then calling in close air support to cover their withdrawal bombs and gun runs and stuff. So um, we're coming in. We're getting close to sunup. Uh, we know that this is... So we've been in Afghanistan a couple of months already and haven't been in contact with the enemy. We've had a lot of false starts and, uh, and missions that get called off at the last second and never really saw the enemy face to face. But we know that there's down aircraft that's actually there and there's missing American actually somewhere. And so this mission is happening. We didn't have great information, but we knew there were people on the ground that needed us. And so we started to find out where we were supposed to land because we knew it wasn't where the down aircraft was. We were past a few different grid locations. We were fairly confused as to which one was the right one. We finally were given a final one, uh, which was actually the same place the other two aircraft had landed. Neil, uh, Nate, let me ask you real yeah. quick, just because I want to understand a little bit here. You know, everything we do in the military is planned. And even if it doesn't go according to plan, we have a plan. So when you're yeah. hearing all this misinformation, and you are not sure what you're going to encounter, what are you thinking and what are you telling your men at this point in time as far as, guys, when we land, this is what we do. How do you even know? Yeah, well, so it's a combination of how you've trained, the kinds of scenarios you've trained for, and you build from that. And so we have specific drills, um, whether they're standard battle drills with making contact with the enemy or reacting to an ambush and things like that that people just know. And you also have standard things like, here's how we're exiting this type of aircraft on the ground in Afghanistan with this type of personnel, which we had rehearsed. And this type of mission, which is a, we have a downed aircraft or we have friendlies nearby. So that stuff was pretty known. And then it becomes a combination from there of what you know to be true, that you can communicate. And then your anticipation uh, and, and, and judgment slash intuition around what you don't know, but your, um, your thinking is happening without going too far on that. Um, cause if you do, you, you can walk right into, um, obviously 
more problems. Is, so, is, well, is scared a fair emotion at that point where you just don't let that creep into your mind? I don't think there was ever an intentional effort to have to push it out. I feel like um, I've always felt like the safest place to be in an environment like that is with the team that I've worked with and trained with and I trust and I know their skills and capabilities and our weapon systems. And so even fast forward to when I was in Iraq, I felt much safer traveling around with an infantry squad than I would have on my own. Uh, you know, if I was a tourist or something like that, obviously, even though when you're an infantry squad, people are trying to kill you, you feel safer in that environment. So on a helicopter going into a battle, I didn't necessarily feel fear. I just felt a lot of anticipation um, and, and excitement around we're finally going to get to do what we have raised our right hands to do. We felt like essentially we've been called to do post 9-11. And so we were all really switched on and eager to get on the ground, especially when you've been in an aircraft for an hour and you're hearing calls on the radio that are coming from guys that are asking where you are. Um, it was more that. It was more how do we get on the ground as quick as we can to help these guys. Yeah, that's a, I can only imagine hearing those calls how it, it must have amped you up from the standpoint of we got to move our tails and get there because, you know, our, our buddies' lives are depending on this. So right before you land, kind of set the scene. Is the sun up yet? What information do you exactly know and, and what happens? So what we know is there's a SEAL team on the ground asking for us. What's ironic about it is there's no more talk about down, down aircraft. There's actually no more talk about a missing guy. There's just talk about a SEAL team on the ground asking where the QRF is. Now, they're connected to both of those previous events. I don't know this. I just know there's a SEAL team near where we're going, and they're in contact. And I think that they're looking for this guy, possibly, but I don't know if they're even close to him. And so what I'm, what I'm telling my guys in the aircraft is we're going to land. We're going to exit the aircraft the way we always do. The landing zone is likely hot, meaning there's enemy nearby. We could be getting shot at, but the, there's also friendlies nearby. So you really have to watch your fires, which is tough. Right? Yeah. There's a, and, and the sun's not up yet. And so we have, we have passed the point where there's light um, beginning to kind of fill the morning. So we're past that twilight point, but we're not at sun up yet. And so we're transitioning off of our night vision. And I'm just struck with how beautiful the area is. There have been a snowstorm the week before, so everything's white and covered with snow. Obviously, the mountains are very beautiful. But all of a sudden, there's a sense of uh, this is an actual battlefield. You know, we, we knew the battle had been going on for a couple of days. And if you visited the battlefield even 100 years or 200 years past a battle, you still have that sense of, this is where it went down. Yep. But, but when it's active, it's been active for a couple of days, and you're kind of thinking, well, I'm never going to go there. These guys are these guys are fighting the war, and we're not. When you're walking into that, it's just a strange uh, and, and very heavy sense of humility that uh, we are going to be a part of this. Um, so the weight of that hit me about a couple of minutes before we got on the ground. Along with that weight, does your mortality come into play at all? Or you didn't have those thoughts? I didn't. I, I just don't, I don't know. I'm, and I had it after that, like I said, in Iraq. But in Afghanistan, I didn't feel that at all. Because that's um, that's a real tough thing. And, and I don't, we talk about it a lot on the podcast, you know, when you have to come to grips with your own mortality, that like, hey, you know, these may be my last moments on this earth. Whatever is going to go down, I might not get out of here. And for us as soldiers, I, I think that I, I've always said this, you know, in all the missions I did in Iraq and everything, you know, there were mornings I would wake up, I just have a sinking feeling like something bad was going to happen and I couldn't escape it. And all I ever did before we got in the vehicles and rolled out was I just kind of found a quiet place to say a quick prayer. And all I ever asked was that I did what I was trained. I took care of my men, took care of the mission. And whatever else happened was in God's hands. I took a deep breath and let it go and never thought about it again until after yeah. I got back. I mean, that's really all you can do. Yeah, and I'll say our experience in Afghanistan up to that point had been not only uh, one of trying to fight a war and, and bring certain people to justice, but it was also for our for our unit a, a 
point in time where we grew very close. A lot of that was around interaction with the chaplain and uh, Bible studies together. And so guys had spent a lot of time kind of processing that daily. And I think that they had mostly reached a point, I know I had reached a point where we were not concerned with the outcome, um, each of us. We were not concerned about our outcome there. We were there to do a job. And it was still such a fresh time in the war that I'm not sure that uh, we had been exposed to casualties to the extent that we knew that it could happen to us. Right. And I think that's why it was such a real shock in the opening moments of our time on the ground on Tucker Gar when you actually realize that guys that were with you in those Bible studies and guys that were just breathing next to you uh, who still still seem like they're next to you alive that they're not and uh, impossible to process absolutely impossible yeah. to process I, I can't I... You know, thankfully for me, I, I didn't go through that uh, with somebody that close while I was in combat. But um, I certainly can empathize because I know people who have. All right. So you have these these kind of feelings that the, you're at this beautiful mountaintop, but the beauty is going to be taken away momentarily. When does that all begin? Yeah. So we're coming in. Uh, we have the best information we think we're going to get. Um, it was probably an error to send us to the same place the other two aircraft had gone in. But if we had not gone into the same place, it would have taken us hours to fight to that location and we might not have ever gotten there. So it was kind of as if we just took the mountain by force by just trying to land there. And we came in, we, we ordered the mountain three times trying to decide, is this really where it wants to land? And just decided, let's take it. So the pilots brought us in and they flared to land. We're about 20 feet off the ground and we got hit really hard. Um, they were waiting on us. Um, they knew we were coming. If they didn't know we were coming back to get those guys, then we signaled that with three orbits of the mountain. And uh, they hit us with RPGs and machine guns from all three sides, everywhere but the rear. And uh, one of the RPGs was from directly under the aircraft, hit the right engine, and they went right into the cockpit from the front. Uh, and so th the pilots were able to crash it into the mountain without it rolling. But they were shot up real bad in the front. Um, but from very close range, we get hit from our left side, the front right. And uh, and on the left side, they were concentrating their fire directly across the ramp of the Chinook, which is in the rear. And that's where we were trying to exit. So guys are being cut down on the ramp as they're coming off. I mean, if you could imagine what it must have been like in a landing craft in World War II, taking a beach, very similar kind of shape and feel coming off the back of a Chinook. There's one ramp at the back. It's where everyone's trying to get out. It's just a tube of metal. And uh, it's kind of a big fatal funnel there. Like what so, you see at the beginning of Saving Private Ryan, essentially, is what people should picture who aren't military. You know that scene where the door yeah. opens and there's just gunfire oh, yeah. just starts popping right at you and there's a big jam of bodies and mess and everything else and you're kind of stuck. Yeah. yeah. So I was all the way up at the front of the aircraft when we hit the ground. Um, by the time I could get to kind of my knees and looked out the ramp, there wasn't a lot of people moving. There was a couple guys actually out of the aircraft already fighting. But most of the guys between me and them were, were on the floor. Uh, some of them were wounded. Some of them were dead. Some of them were trying to get loose from their safety lines, which were hooked to the floor. Uh, because when we landed, we were kind of tilted nose up. So those safety lines had got taut. You had to kind of relieve the pressure there to get loose. So I just started crawling over guys because I was already unhooked. I got to the ramp, I fell over two other rangers who were dead. Um, Do you and, remember their names? Oh, of course. Uh, Matt Commons and Brad Kroos um, were there on the ramp. They, they were in the lead team coming off, and they were hit. As everyone essentially was coming off the back of the aircraft, pretty much everyone was hit, or their, whether it was a wound or their equipment was hit, helmets, body armor, weapons, whatever, we were getting ahead coming off. By the time I got into the snow off the ramp, uh, the squad leader, the ranger squad leader, um, who was on with me, was already changing magazines. And he had gone through his first round um, of ammunition and was changing and reloading before I even got off. 
so he was working hard and doing good work and um uh i remember some cracks over my head pushed me to the right side of the aircraft and i ran into some other enemy and we we just started fighting um i felt for a brief moment as if maybe we were in the wrong place because why would someone bring you in there um i didn't see any sign of friendlies so i just thought maybe we were tricked into coming to the wrong place or i didn't really know exactly why we had landed there um, because nothing matched up you just get shot at um so within the first couple of minutes i look around and there's just literally a handful of guys outside the aircraft fighting out of 21 on board aircraft there's a handful um and so we just the training takes over you know there's really not a lot of thought required um you're reacting to the enemy you're trying to locate him you're trying to get their heads down you're trying to move on and uh thankfully we're in a unit that used to shoot a lot and uh the guys are really good at it and we move very well as a small unit and um we started to kind of push the enemy back and establish a little bit of perimeter around our aircraft Nate, it's got to be tough at this point in time. I'm just envisioning this because you're dealing with multiple challenges. Like, not only do you have guys who are hit and wounded and guys who are killed already, but you're in this huge aircraft that's now broken and is the easiest thing to spot on the mountain from wherever you are. And the enemy knows that there are Americans there. Like, they, they know that's where to swarm to. And you're taking fire from three sides already, even if you push them back, to get your bearings about you as to what to do next must have been incredibly difficult. Yeah, I, I don't mind saying I was pretty confused in the first few minutes. Um, I was trying to figure out what direction was what, get my map out, trying to figure out exactly where we are, where the other friendlies might be in relation to this, where that aircraft that went down, where that is, um, why in the world. Um, it seems like there's enemy all around us and no friendlies. I did not get on my radio to contact anyone outside of um, our unit immediately because we were essentially too busy scanning our sectors and trying to uh, keep everyone alive. Um, but there's also a second aircraft in my flight, which is, I don't know where it is. It's another 10 Rangers on board. And uh, what ha what happened was right before we got in the last couple of minutes of flight, we lost contact with them on the radio and visually. And they couldn't reestablish contact with us. So they flew to a friendly location about 10 minutes away and landed and tried to raise us on the radio. And then they found out we were shot down. So we were kind of alone for a while. Uh, one of my Air Force guys who's really good with calling in close air support kind on the radio. And that was the only radio we were using was finding out what was nearby overhead. As far as fast movers go, jets that could give us some support. And so we got a pair of F-15s on the on, uh, on station with us and started spending their um, the bullets, no bombs, but making gun runs to our front. Uh, but, the, Nate, how did you know where you were? Like you, when you call those in, you have to give them a coordinate, right? I mean, did you just have a GPS that gave it to them, or you? Yeah, we all carried little garments and okay, and uh, we had maps. I mean, you know, if your if your area of operations is all of Afghanistan. You have to be ready to grab maps on the way out. That was part of our drill. So I had the map pulled and in my pocket, folded it, ready to go, and some imagery of what was around me. The intelligence guys did a good job of making sure we had what we need, it needed. And so it was just basic map reading stuff. And gotcha, okay. A couple, of, a couple of GPSs to make sure we are in the right place. And then uh, you know, that's the drill for those guys that call in close air support. Obviously, they have to know where they are uh, or they'll take a risk dropping on themselves, and especially when we're talking about 75 meters to our front. Um, you got to be very uh, precise about where you are. I mean, did those airstrikes save your life? I don't, I don't have any doubt that they did. Um, not just those. I mean, this was hours and hours of handing off to another crew. F-15s, F-16s, another pair of F-15s, another pair of F-16s, F-18s, French Mirages, all day long, almost nonstop. Um, they were flawless. They were unbelievable. And we were asking them to do things that they typically would not do. Um, we have other airframes that can support troops in contact 
with direct fire. But these guys were asked to do it. They took the risk, and they were perfect. And so whenever I get to interact with anyone from the Air Force, particularly veterans, I tell them, you know, if I sign a book over to one, I say, you know, you know I love the Air Force to save my life. Um, Amazing. So, great. So how long does it take that other chopper of the 10 Rangers who were part of the QRF to get to you? Um, it was quite a while. Uh, we were on the ground alone for a while. Um, when they did land, they weren't with us. They landed at the base of the mountain and started to climb to us. And so they're climbing through some heavy snow drifts. They've got a lot of equipment. They start dropping equipment, leaving it on the battlefield just so they can get to us quicker. Um, and they thought they were, when they landed, they thought they were 45 minutes away from us. And then 45 minutes later, we ask them, where are you? And it's clear that, it's clear that they're at least another 45 minutes away. And that happened probably three times. And I think they got to us by 1030. And so we, we hit the ground at 615, 612, 612 in the morning, local. And they didn't get to us till 1030 or so. So we were on the ground for a little over four hours by ourselves with about, five guys that could actually move and then a couple of others that could pull triggers but they couldn't really move how are you dealing with the wounded at this point as far as trying to keep them alive and i mean I've, that's one of our all of our tasks you know if we have a wounded comrade we gotta you know, just let him sit there and bleed so what's that status like yeah um that's a really tough thing to manage um it's first of all not something you can simulate in training we're not going to wound our own guys just so we can do a good job of uh, patching them back up. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Uh, but we try to take it as realistically as we can in training. Um, and we had medical personnel that had received some higher level training, which was dealing with live tissue. And so that was comforting to know. We had a flight, basically a flight medic on board our aircraft. I had several advanced EMTs that were in the Ranger unit that were on board the aircraft with me. So we had some advanced medical care available, not advanced medical care, advanced medical skills in our personnel available. Plus we had two Air Force pararescue jumpers um, who were very uh, good medical uh, guys. Unfortunately, two of those guys a little bit into the fight were shot pretty badly. So we lost a couple of our medical guys, um, and, and now we have more casualties to treat with fewer people. Um, but the psychological effect of casualties in your midst when you're trying to fight is pretty profound. And it's very difficult mentally to um, focus on the task that you know you need to be doing because you feel a bit cold in trying to focus away from people that you love when they're in pain. And I would say that that fundamentally as a leader of soldiers is one of the foundational challenges that you have, no matter where you're in training or in combat is balancing the love for each other with upholding standards that you must uphold and doing what you know you need to do, even though your heart is telling you to do something else. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's also keeping yourself alive too. I mean, you know, that's like third on the priority list. <laughs> you know, it's take care of your buddy first, <laughs> take care of the mission second. Oh, by the way, don't, don't get wounded or killed in the process. Yeah. We, we had fortunately trained um, pretty explicitly that, especially if you're in a building or something like that, the best thing you can do for a casualty is to, is to take care of the enemy. And so that translates to other, other types of battlefields too. And, and, and we knew, and that's, that's what I mean, we had to kind of focus on, we got to take care of the enemy in order to take care of the wounded. And if we're not taking care of the enemy, we just have more wounded and eventually no one makes it out of here. Right. Um, but there were some cries early on from wounded and from guys treating wounded to, hey, when are we going to get these guys out of here? And you feel that sense of urgency because you think you know how badly they're wounded, but you don't really know, especially if the wounds are deep, how bad it is. 
so our guys are trying to make assessments and recommendations about how much time we have but you don't know uh, if you have less time than that or you have more time than that and you also don't want to do something tactically unsound which could compromise everything and so you have pressure of balancing the two emotionally on one hand but even mentally uh, trying to make good decisions was one of the things I felt um, and the risk reward of dropping bombs around you to keep the enemy away when you know those bombs could win to your own guys is also you know one of those dilemmas you face in close contact like that. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast. Tune in next week for part two of this episode. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.